there's a lot of fluff and a lot of uh, a lot of politician speak, or rather, a lot of like hallmarks of the managerial class. But what it is essentially is a way of a total vision of restructuring global, uh, globalized uh, society around a lot of different principles that some would say consider whatever parochial term you want to use globalism uh internationalism basically and this was but keep in mind the great the 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 great reset is a plan that is much older than the current pandemic but it sort of the pandemic uh approach to it was packaged into the plan and they have this sort of point bulletin that has different spheres of society from education to uh um infrastructure the the uh the economy very various different social organs to create almost a global managerial state uh out of the the davos world economic uh forum sort of clique and a lot of different heads of states and corporations are getting involved in pledging their support of this global total restructuring of not just the economy but social life itself uh through various mm. means and the way they package this is to explicitly uh, counter the rise of what um, I forget the founder's name who founded the World Economic Forum. But he talks at length about defending, uh, quote unquote, democratic principles from things like nationalism and uh, tribalism and so forth. And so what they're doing is they're they're approaching the the global global issues through this sort of uh what you would say the quintessential final stage of the end of history, like neoliberal globalized society. And they have a bunch of asides about technology and there's a little bit of transhumanism in there as well. Basically using uh, instrumental reason and the technology that is born uh, to restructure all social relations and to use things like uh, gene editing and CRISPR and new surveillance technologies to create a sort of a one world society. And they're very explicit about this too, which I find hilarious, but that's, that's my, so it's not a very detailed plan, I suppose, really. It's sort of a, it, it a vision have, more than a plan. It's, it's a vision, but they do have a, a few details, but yet it's, it is quite hazy. Uh, having read a bit of the book, even it's they they have various numbers and various uh, issues that they want to tackle, but really uh, it comes down to a lot of very common tropes. Now keep in mind, I'm biased obviously against a lot of these. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about mm. that. I'm curious to hear. So uh, people, uh, I know we're having on the show who are more in tune with like the structures of yeah. So so uh, Mariam, I would love to uh, hear uh, your thoughts on this. Yeah, actually, I think this is a great plan uh, because uh, what I read about it and what I know about it is like they, they want to like push markets to a more fairer outcomes. And I think uh, COVID has provided us uh, with an opportunity to like ask for things which people or market players thought that they cannot do and are very difficult to do. Like for example, before um, insurance in US, health insurance is very important. And uh, COVID showed us that when someone loses their job, they also lose their insurance. So they are highlighting the cracks which were already present in the system. So now the World Economic Forum is coming up with uh, like this initiative and telling us now is the time to fix these cracks in the system. So I, I really like their this point that they should push market to a more fairer outcomes. I, I feel this is the time that we need to uh, ask the market participants and we need to push for a more competitive market. So yeah, I, I think it is a great initiative. Who, uh, in uh, your um, thoughts, would decide what is fair and what is not fair? I think this is the job of the government to decide, like, the competition. If market is very uncompetitive, 
and uh, new entrants can't enter a uh, market and there is like uh, uh, an increasing inequality, then I think government with the help of economists or international organizations can tell that we need to fix the market. We, we do not have a fair market. Uh, what, what do the rest of you guys think? Uh, Haka says. Um, I guess the one thing that's interesting is it, it's set up as a very, very large plan with a lot of different moving parts. You'd have medicine, you have business, you have economy structure, and you have currency denominations. Uh, trying to do all of those at once on a huge level seems incredibly dangerous to me. Um, a lot of these systems are work relatively well the way they are. Obviously, they have problems in different countries, different parts of the world. Uh, I would think that uh, if some of these ideas uh, have merit, that they should be tested on a smaller level to see if they work. You know, try a small island country. If some, if a, a principle isn't working at a small level, it's not going to scale to a big level. I think that would be uh, one of the first things I would look at. That's a but, good point. Yeah. Mariam? Mm-hmm. Uh, wh what do you think? I think um, he is right in some ways, like uh, saying that some of the things are already good enough, but we have to think like there are certain things that we must worry about and we can means break them up into smaller uh, outcomes then we can work toward them and we we see that there is some discontent with our existing system so i think we can work on it like even before covid everyone was worried maybe robots would replace us robots would replace the uh, labor force mm -hmm. then i think these are genuine questions and this if we have a plan and we have an initiative then we have more reason to act on these I would love to bring huh. this to um, Catherine Brodsky and Mitchelson, who is just joining us right now. After a long while, Mitchelson, can you hear us? Can we hear you? Just want to make sure about the audio. Okay, no sign. Mute on. Okay, no yeah. sign yet. Uh, so we will wait for Mitchelson. But Catherine, go ahead. Uh, what do you think? Sure. Um, I think um, the reasoning behind wanting to do this great reset has a lot of sort of nobility to it. However, I feel like it ties into the whole COVID thing, which has kind of highlighted a lot of problems that existed before, but also COVID, you know, we're in this kind of a desperate state right now. It's gotten done incredible damage to our economies. Businesses are shattered forever. It's not great for our well being. But at the same time, this is I would hope is a temporary issue. And so I feel like uh, this whole reset is piggybacking on a like a huge global crisis to take advantage of that and put into play things that are much more permanent and kind of dangerous. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, looking at the three components in the agenda that they have. So one was to steer the market towards a fair outcome. Well, that kind of scares me because it's such a vague thing. Like how? It sounds like a nice thing, like a fair outcome. But I agree anyway. with that because I'm wondering who, who's going to be doing the steering. Exactly. You know, not going to be a, a Is big this an elected group? group? Is this, well, uh... well, Mariam was talking about earlier that it would be done by the government as well as other interests around the government. And to me, but that's always... Already... That's always been a scary thing. You know, why would yeah, you trust exactly. Mariam? Why would you trust anybody? these people who don't really like uh, Haka says just said right now that they don't answer to anybody? Why would you well, trust maybe, these people? Maybe, with, maybe uh, not. We don't we don't really have true. we don't the details of the plan. Sure. But it well, doesn't I, seem like they're talking about elected bodies making these decisions. It sounds no. like there there's some uh what what do you call it? Uh, people behind the curtain. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be people then behind I the curtain say, so big. Yeah, Marianne, yeah. Yeah, but then I would say then uh, we all we say that we can trust markets, but we can't trust government. I think I would say I would trust government more than the market. 
I would trust government far less than market because uh, a government you're putting in like these these very specific things in place to make it fair and we've already seen that being implemented across different spheres for example with the representation of women and jobs in some ways it's great because like you know people who m might have had a difficult time entering the field but at the same time some um because you're kind of doing an uh, equality of outcome as opposed to just equality of opportunity um you're you're also placing a lot of people in these positions that may not deserve to be there and so it actually leads people to think more poorly of th that group of hmm. people well, I think they may or may have not earned their place. Could there. I expand on that? Go the the it. point, the question was whether you trust governments versus markets, and I don't think there's a, a clear answer to that. I think some governments are more trustworthy than others. You know, you might trust an open democracy more than you would trust North Korea or uh, Chinese Communist Party. Uh, same thing with markets. You might trust an open, uh, we'll say, a competitive market like. Uh, I don't know, software development, take your, take your pick, but some markets are probably more trustworthy than others, you know, say an art, art market or uh, versus the petroleum industry. You know. <laughs> art market's a bad example. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think, I, I think like um, to, to answer a lot of, what's interesting about the Great Reset, and I feel that it's sort of like a typical, and I don't mean to make a point like I'm I'm above like your typical analysis like, but I I do feel that the whole thing with like market versus government I feel is kind of a bit limiting because the Great Reset the reason it's unique is because it's not um it's not exactly a Marxist plan of abolishing a market but it's not exactly um any sort of it it really is pure internationalism in the sense that my fear would be the symbiosis between governments and corporations getting together. And the, I, I, my argument would be that, uh, yeah, a pure technocracy that be, the thing is to me, I don't really see a lot of differences between um, corporate bodies and government bodies nowadays, the way that global power is structured. So I, I, I sympathize with people that are more libertarian that, that do, uh, fear an uh, encroachment of government but i feel that in the same time i i sympathize with Miriam in the sense i don't sympathize with the great reset obviously but uh, i'm more radical yeah. in, in this i mean sense. there are but, a lot of problems going on but i do there's a, a lot of problems with the way the global economy is structured obviously problems with monopolies especially yeah that yeah. government well that that will say a lot of uh well that's actually a lot of corporations a, run yeah. governments that's by it. the way Catherine, you're looking very swimming today yes i didn't realize how how uh uh, look, Bruggius, your eyes are. <laughs> look, Bruggius. So, um, so, well, yeah. Mariam, like you're in Pakistan right now. In Pakistan, from what I understand, it's a developing nation. It's dealing with a lot of its own problems. And I can understand coming from the idea of like, if only we had some of these international bodies that can make things work out fairer for us. The only problem is I'm personally like, I don't want to go on the whole rant about the USSR again, but I'm originally from the oh, Soviet Union. And this is, I see what happens when a small <laughs> amount of people get to decide things for a lot of people and uh do you understand where i'm coming from here like why i could potentially see this as being a really draconian situation when you have a bunch of these technological oligarchs that have control over our data and have control over the way we live mm -hmm. i understand your concern and i think uh, i know where you are coming from but I think situation is different when we talk of markets, when markets are not working for like 90% or 99% of our population, then there is a problem. Then we have to like come up with a solution. We have to think that how could we fix that? And obviously market themselves will never go and fix their problems then who would be i think it is the responsibility of the government to regulate markets to correct them so that's why i feel that whenever you see that market is not working the system is not working then it becomes the job of the government to fix the system because who else the uh, players in market they would never do it so I would say it would be government. I would be left with government to do it. Well, I 
otherwise if we do not trust government then people would be on roads there would be like some kind of revolution or something like that then we also don't like that and with this i think i might go because it's really late over here uh i really appreciate Good. you uh being Thank here you but for coming. but i did want to get Catherine to say what you wanted to say uh first because i saw like the gears are turning so any oh yeah no i was gonna ask her actually like what makes her think that 99 percent of the people are not being served by these systems that's a huge number and second of all um, when it comes to some government interference, because I kind of agree that there needs to be, I mean, I don't think you can have a complete free for all because um, it's not perfect. The world is not perfect. Um, so government interference does to have to happen to some extent, but like to what extent? I would love to know uh, Miriam's thoughts on that. I think uh, I also agree that there should be like certain um, regulatory power with government i would say when we see that uh, the market is being incompetitive or some firms are manipulating the market share yeah. and like for example facebook is buying everything facebook can buy anything in the market and we see only four or five dominant players in the market i think then we can think that okay now maybe there is something wrong in the market we have to fix that and secondly when we see that the workers uh, they their living conditions are like uh, getting deteriorated and people are not making a decent life with their uh, earnings then we can say that uh, means inequality has risen a lot and we we see that du even during the pandemic jeff bezos uh, could make abnormal profits, then I think then we can say that, okay, now the government should step in and do something about it. Yeah, there's, there's, there's the there thing, will be like, power a lot of things monopolies. are also getting better too. Like um, when you're looking at the developing world, things are, are, are getting better. When you're looking at-, at oh, I don't know, Bob. I don't know. Well, well That's people, debate. you have to, you have to look at the quality of That's life for the right average there. person. That's three hours lower. right there. <laughs> I also have to ask, what, what is the life? metric of success? Because all different countries have different metrics of success. Well, my but... metric mm -hmm. of success would be how is the person sort of towards the lower end of, of income? Yeah. So, so not uh, just by mobility. Better? What do they yeah. call it? economic just by mobility? How much money the people on top are yeah. making. <laughs> I love like the just because somebody's going super rich and I'm not as rich as that person doesn't mean yeah, the yeah. quality of my life is bad. And I think a lot of times people look at these people who are in the one percent and they're like, they're one percent, and I'm nowhere near. I can't buy that yacht. Yeah, you know, but I can buy groceries. You know, and and years ago, somebody in the middle class would not be able to buy yeah. groceries, right? So we're yeah. It's, so maybe the opportunity. I wanted to uh, before uh, Mariam, you go. I just wanted to quickly say here is an article where it's talking about stakeholder capitalism, which is actually what this is about. So let's I read not, that article. Yeah, let's not mince words here. We're not exactly talking about the government being in control either. What we're talking that, yeah. about here is okay. So this is from National Review. It says, uh, but this is. Not not enough for the apostles of stakeholder capitalism. They want to enforce the principle that a company's shareholders, its owners, are just one category of stakeholder. This transfers the power that capital should confer away from its owners and into the hands of those who administer it. They are then responsible to, well, it's not uh, quite clear who. It's not difficult to grasp why so many corporate managements are enthused by stakeholder capitalism. But stakeholder <laughs> capitalism is a betrayal. <laughs> but that's yeah. the rub a, of it. Is a betrayal of democracy. Yeah. Love it. I think that's it's cool. really cool when good things happen to my friends because then maybe they'll happen to me. <laughs> that's well, the here... thing. Like the fact that corporations are very enthralled by this plan, I think, is is really <laughs> boggling to the typical order of. If like, they're the American ones that are hurt by it, why would they support it? it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah. Mariam, yeah. I, I know you got to go, but oh, she went. Oh, oh, she left. oh okay. Yeah. I didn't even get to say. There they will. I have kind of a mixed feeling about this because me myself, if I had a corporate Corporation, I would like to put some shareholder uh, opportunities in the hands of my longtime employees mm. because I yeah. want them to feel like they have an ownership. I think it will serve my business also. And I think it's a good thing to do. 
but mm-hmm. but <laughs> Look at I don't know. But I don't know if that I want to force companies to do that because I think ultimately I am taking the risk. Like that's my decision to make. But but right. as somebody who's starting business, I'm taking all the risks. So why should I automatically do that? So I think it should be a choice. I think it's a nice thing to do. I think sometimes there's benefits to the business with that, but it's a choice, not a forced. I think on a business level that one of the biggest problems that usually comes in is that uh, they they sort of hit a wall, is that somebody trying to start a business hits a wall of anti-competitive practices. The people that are in charge running a certain industry right now own the industry. There's no way for somebody else to get in. Like, mm-hmm. there's no way you could start a bank today with the amount yeah. of regulatory hurdles Just or whatever. Just start your own social media yeah. company, bro. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you and can't uh, do that today. You need yeah. at least, you know, 10 or 20 lawyers to work out the legal loopholes. You got to work on the terms of service, and, license uh, agreement, like infrastructure. Say, it, it's, there. there's no, the, there's, the monopolies that are in place are sort of hard to break. <laughs>